with us or hang out. Um, tonight's the last night that I'm going to be able to, get, to join you. Tomorrow night it would be your team, but um, um, we have an early uh, thing on Friday. So um, I just wanted to say that. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, so, yes, tonight, prayer ministries, if you want that, just come forward so that we can identify you and pray with you. Uh, secondly, um, what was it now? Yes, Saturday. Saturday morning. Uh, I, take, I mentioned to you before that I take care of three Seventh-day Adventist churches in the area, one up the road in Tikipanga, one over here, and then the one in Dargaville. But this, it so happens that this Saturday uh, morning, I am over here preaching, and I just want to extend the invitation to you to join us for our hour of worship, and uh, we're going to continue this theme in some way as we, uh, as we continue to look at Scripture and, uh, and recovery. So I just want to invite you to, to join us if you'd like to. Uh, we would be most most, uh, most uh, privileged to have you join us uh, then on Saturday morning. Uh, Cherie, you want to come up? Yes. Question and answer time. Oh, am I, is this on? Yes. Okay, good. Right. Yes, sir. So, um, so one of the things you've, you've uh, really brought home to us over the time you've been with us here is that it is sometimes hard to reach, uh, to reach someone or to invite someone into recovery who is not in the place where they want that. Like, you can't force that on it. I, I, know, I know, and I mentioned to you th this to you in private, I know when I do my series on addiction and recovery. Has uh, anybody in different, seen that? It's really good. Okay, just saying. In All different right. places that inevitably there's a mother... Uh, usually the mother, not so much the father, but the mother will usually come up to me and say, you know what, Adrian, um, this is the name of my son and I want you to phone him. I, I, I want you, I want you to, to see him. I want you to go, I don't know, you know, I don't know what they go expect, but him. go fix him. Yeah. Is there a magic bullet yeah. I wish for the person who is not in that space yet? Yeah. I wish there was, because I get those, those things too, and I will tell somebody that we never do that. Like, if you give me the number of your child, we'll never call, but I can tell you that if that child calls me, I will drop everything and talk with them. So it's, it's a matter of you can't force recovery. You can't force someone into insight. You can't force someone to clean up. Um, but, man, prayer is powerful. So stay praying. Stay covering. Um, you know, I, I'm straight up with the people I love. I may sound obnoxious, like my, my daughter was struggling. Um, 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 I sent her to a Christian school and the Bible teacher was a molester. And um, she was so injured and so she went through a lot of things. And then while she was going through these things and emotionally, three years of stuff. And I remember one time just said, if I have to, I will throw myself on the floor and, and, and weep and cry and beg you. You know, so I'm really straight up. Please, please hear me. Please listen, whatever. So, and so when you get an opportunity to those that you love to share stuff with them, share it. Don't be obnoxious and stop. Um, don't do it constantly, but be straight up. You know what, I, I, your addiction scares me. Um, uh, the way you're thinking right now scares me, but know that I am praying for you, and I'm your mom, and I will never stop. Um, and so, you know, being straight up with each other, but you can't, uh, even with Jackie. You know, I couldn't force her um, into, in, into healing. Um, and she had to struggle with a lot of things before she um, um, decided um, that she would survive. All right, that was the heavy question. Now the trivial question. Hey, what's my favorite um, No, not quite that trivial. Uh, you know, you, you're really busy speaking uh, schedule. You hear Hamilton, Papatoe, you go back to the Sturgis Bike Rally in the U.S., um, just appointment after appointment away from home. Do you ever do this thing called fun, and what does that look like? Yeah. And what's really fun about that is that um, I, I told you that my husband built an art studio, so I love the arts. Yep. Um, I have horses that I love, um, and so I ride. Um, we play golf together, and we are um, we like to cycle. So, so I think that 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 if you had your day or your life in a pie, and fun is part of that pie that has to be met. It's like every piece of that pie matters. Work matters. Religion matters. Connection matters with your spouse. Connection with friends, but also fun and laughter. That's a piece of it, and it, it's not a piece that can be ignored. And so I think that I, I value my time or my fun time. And I didn't know this about guys, <laughs> but, you know, guys, they really like to just have fun with you. 
Um, there's something about just just having fun and just laughing or whatever. Unless you're with a workaholic, then it's a little bit tough to do. Um, but um, part of the needs of the, that for, for men is that respect and that position, um, but the fun and laughter. So I like golf. I, I'm actually pretty good at it. I like cycling. I like arts. I like horses. I like skiing. Um, I like kayaking. You know, so, so I, I play tons. Sounds good. Let me pray with you. Okay. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together here this evening. Thank you for bringing these precious uh, people back each evening. Uh, it's been a busy week. Uh, for some of us, it's been a hard week. There's been good work that's been done by your grace, and, um, and, and you're leading. You're leading as we step into the experience of recovery. And my prayer tonight, Lord, is just that you would keep doing what you are doing, that uh, if there are any hearts that are still resistant, still, still maybe too shy, too afraid, too ashamed, that you would uh, knock a little harder, perhaps speak a little more gently, whatever it takes, that your spirit would speak directly and use a Sheree this evening as your instrument and, um, and uh, as your servant. Bless her, give her stamina, give her grace, give her strength. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So and I, I'll start with, we're talking about the stages of recovery tonight. I love this presentation. I love um, talking about that. But I want to talk about Jackie since um, um, it came up in the questions. My daughter is a, she's just an incredible kid. Like I never thought I would have kids. Um, and I get pregnant with her, and she's adorable. She was, you know, from the time she was born, um, I, I loved this kid. And she was very normal, which scared me. Like, <laughs> I'm ADD, and I'm recovering. And this is a kid that was born in a healthy home with Christian parents. And, and she's normal in every way. Um, even when she was three years old, I, I constantly lost my keys. And she looked at me real serious, and she said, Mom, if you put them in the same place each time... <laughs> And I thought, whose kid is this? You know, it's just like, she was just, just this normal, beautiful kid. I, I kept her away from my family a lot because my family is very damaged. And I just, I just didn't want to lose her to addiction. So, and, and then plus, there's a lot of molest, a lot of abuse in our family, um, from uncles to my dad to, um, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of that. So I just was very protective. Um, when I did go take her to my family's house, I, she never spent the night with anybody. She never was babysat by anyone because, I mean, I was molested since I was three months old. So we have all that kind of stuff. And so I never did that. Sent her to a Christian school. And I said that I told you the Bible teacher was a, a perpetrator. Um, she started getting um, seduced or sexualized with him from the fifth grade, and he acted out um, on the kids when they were in the eighth grade. So there was a long relationship. Um, when he was indicted and arrested, um, uh, she tried to kill herself. So it was, a, it was for, for me, I thought I protected her her whole life. Do you know what I mean? From every place that could be damaged. And now I had to literally get down on my knees and just say, I don't, I'm, I'm lost, and I don't know how to reach her, and She's angry, and um, raise your hand if you had kids where they don't want to go to church anymore, and they, they're just backing away from all that, and she did all that kind of stuff. And, and so I said to her, you know, Jackie, we don't have to go to church. We'll do Sabbath together. Um, if you don't want to go, we'll go hiking, um, but we're going to do Sabbath. So, I mean, we're going to just do our own thing. And then when we go to church, but, you know, as, as you're living here, this is, who we are, and, but I knew she was damaged, so I didn't want to. Um, I, I didn't want to say you're going to do it this way, because I, I don't know what her life is going to look like in her healing. Um, so you know, there are times that we just hike together. There are times that we, you know, we would do whatever the devotion or the Bible. And and one day she's so mad at me. She's like, I said, okay, what do you want to do on uh, Sabbath? How do you want to go to church? And she said, no, I'm not going. All right, um, let, uh, let's just do um, some Bible reading devotions. She's like, ugh, oh, okay. And she's so angry. And I said, um, um, so um, do you want to start with Old Testament, New Testament? I told you, I don't care. I just don't care. You pick. No, no, you pick, hon. So finally she's like, okay, Old Testament. And I was afraid to say this next thing. I said, okay, what book? <laughs> And I know, she's just, you know, so I don't care, no, pick a book. And I think she was going to stump me, so she says, Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah is just, he's called the weeping prophet. And right now, as a mother, I was weeping. So, I mean, I get that. So, I'm thinking, okay. And my, my heart was pounding. I said, what chapter? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'm like, it just was crazy because I thought we're good, I'm going to get in such trouble. And so she went to a chapter that one of the verses said that you've gotten so far out there that you have forgotten even how to blush. And in our addictions, I mean, we do. You know, in her anger and her rebellion, um, she was, and she started crying, and she said, Mom, I don't know how to get back. And I just cried with her, and I said, you know, I just watched her come back on some level. You know, just in saying that, just in recognizing her saying that. And I said to her, uh, I, and, I, and I love this, I said, you know what, Jackie? Let God show you something. Let him tell you a joke. Let him, let it, let him be real to you. And he said, she said, Mom, I am not one of your clients. <laughs> and I thought, I believe this. I believe this. I worked with a girl one time that we were doing camp meeting, and she was, I didn't know she was struggling, but she was walking away from a relationship with God. She's like 17 years old, just this beautiful homeschooled kid, has never even been outside of her home. She's just the cutest little thing, long dress, no makeup on, knows how to cook any kind of health food you want. I mean, this is, she is a sweet, 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 sweet kid. And we're working together. I don't know why they trusted me with her, but we're working together. She's singing. We're doing camp meeting. We had about 250 so kids in camp meeting, and there was a little group of kids that were doing the worship music, and, and I'm, I'm the speaker. Um, the, the camp meeting was so anointed, one kid came over, and he said, you know, I want to give my heart to God and go through recovery. Here, here's my weed. You could just have it. And gives me a bag of weed. And I'm thinking, you don't give that to an addict in recovery. Give it to the pastor. You know, I was like, and so, but it was so cool that kids were doing that. We had an anointing service at the end that was just so beautiful. And, but we had been working nonstop. By the end of the night, I'm exhausted. And this was a two-week camp meeting. We had one more day left. And we, it was just exhausting, but it was all so good. And I'm getting ready to leave. And this girl, Angela, comes up. And she's just beautiful. And she says, can I talk with you for a minute? And the way she said it, I thought, oh, not tonight. I feel like white noise, you know? And so she's like, um, I said, okay, let's get in the car, shut the door. And we can talk. And she says to me, she's just, she said, you know what? I don't know if I believe in God anymore. Every time I do anything, somebody says, oh, if you do that, you're not going to be saved. Or if you do that. And she said, I just don't care. And I don't know if I believe. And, 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 and she's just looking at me so lost. And she said, um, Cherie, what do you suggest? Tell me something. And I started praying right away. I'm exhausted. You know, how about if I tell you something in the morning, you know, and, and let's pray about it. And I'm just praying, God, what do I tell a kid that has, you know what they do for fun all summer? They go to three camp meetings. She's in camp meetings. She's just, she, I mean, her family, this is what they do. And, and I, I, don't, I can't relate to that world, but I know that she is really lost and she's walking away from all of that. And, and I said, God, what do I tell her? And I got really clear. Tell her that I'm going to tell her a joke tomorrow. And I thought, is that from you? <laughs> And I'm thinking, God, is that from you? And I'm not even sure because I'm thinking, that's weird. And she looked at me like, um, did God tell you to tell me something? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and she said, no, what, what, did you, what do you need to tell me? And I said, okay, I believe. Does anybody believe that God actually speaks to us? The Bible says it. You know, Peter, he been with an Ananias and Sapphira. There's a couple sold his house, and, and God told him exactly what he sold it for. You know, so, you know, to have God actually speak to us is not a bizarre thing. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting used to that. And, and, you know, you don't hear voices, but you get this impression. So I said, so I, Angela, I believe that God said he's going to tell you a joke tomorrow. And she says, does God tell jokes? Apparently, because he's going to tell you one, you know. And I said, so tonight, we're going to pray like crazy that you hear the joke. Tomorrow when you wake up, you pray again. I'll pray again. And then I'll see you back at the tent tomorrow night, because that was our last meeting, right? 
So I'm, I, and I said, then get out of my car now because I'm tired. So, um, so she leaves and she's stunned and I leave and I'm thinking, I hope, I hope that was right on. And, 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 and I get home and I pray and the next day, um, her mom gets up and they're going to go to Kmart or Walmart or whatever and she has to get something for a camp meeting. And Angela says, my mom, when my mom walks into one of those stores, she just browses. I know it's going to be, she's not going to just go and get the thing. She's going to browse or whatever. And so Angela's going through the DVDs in the back of the store just to kill time while her mom shops, right? And she said this little boy comes up, cute little boy, comes up and says, hey, do you have a quarter? And Angela look, looks at him like, you talking to me? Yeah, do you have a quarter? And she said, did your mom just tell you you couldn't have a quarter? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and so you're asking everybody in the store? And he said, yeah. <laughs> you're going to be president someday, she said. <laughs> and so she went in this huge story about, you know what, when I was a kid and my mom said I couldn't have a quarter, I just assumed I couldn't have a quarter. I didn't go to, uh, to everybody in the store. And this kid was listening to the whole thing. Why? Because when she shuts up, she's going to give him a quarter. Do you know what I mean? So he's like, come on, get on with the story. And he's just hanging out. And at the end of the whole thing that she said, the whole story she's saying, she says, I don't have a quarter. And he's like, really? <laughs> I listened to that whole thing, and you don't even have a quarter? And he starts to go away, but she said it was absolutely so cute that she said, Wait. I have a quarter. And he runs back up and he gives her, she gives him the quarter. And then they go to like a Taco Bell or someplace. They get a burrito and now they're going to come to camp meeting. But they're in line for getting the burrito. And she says for the first time she hears God speak to her. And all he says is, Angela, I have quarters. And she says in her mind, why would you give them to me though? And he said, because you're so cute. And she starts laughing. And when she comes back to camp meeting, she runs across the lawn and she's yelling at all of us, God has quarters. <laughs> and so it was the funniest thing. We all are laughing our head off. And she now is in evangelism. If you look at my Facebook, her name is Angela McPherson. She went to Andrews. She's an amazing kid, but she did not leave God. But God, for the first time in her life, spoke to her. So, so when I said that to my daughter, Jackie, let God show you something, it's because I've seen him do that. And so Jackie is like, I'm not one of your clients. Mom, you got to back off and na 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 and she's hurt and she's angry she's tried to kill herself I mean all of that kind of stuff and we are as a family just in so much pain right and um so she said okay God could show me something and I said what is that and she said pink elephants <laughs> and I thought you are such a brat <laughs> We don't even have elephants. We live in Idaho. We have potatoes. That's what we have. And so I am like, hon, pink elephants. And she said, pink elephants. You ask me, if God wants to show me something, show me that. And she just walked away. And, you know, she's a teenager. She was just injured, and she's being rebellious and all that kind of stuff. And so one day I'm shopping, and I'm going through the store. And I go through the cookie aisle. And there's these animal cookies and they're pink and white. What do you think all the pink ones were? Elephants. I bought like 30 bags. <laughs> I put them all over the house <laughs> where she gets on her computer and all the steps to her room. There were pink elephants everywhere. When she came in the house, she's looking at me like, Mom, you know. But she changed. Her life started to change. I told the story one time on 3ABN. She got a pink elephant from Israel. <laughs> Just a little thing. People sent her pink elephant sheets. She's got sippy cups, pink elephants. She's got jammies, pink elephants. She's got a collection now a wall of pink elephants of every kind in every boxes, um, stuffed animals. And so what she did to God and laughed, she gets pink elephants from everywhere. And I bet you there's somebody here that will run into a pink elephant someday and decide to send it to my daughter. And so she gets them everywhere, right? So I really believe 
that God is that kind of God in our recovery. He wants to be with us and bless us and show us something. And so I never, there's never a time that I doubt that. If you feel like you're disconnected from God and you have not heard him, ask him to tell you a joke. Ask him to show you something. Literally get in the word of God because that's how he speaks mostly. He speaks from, um, from the word of God. He speaks to us, to each other. But man, don't think that he can't tell you a joke. Don't think that he cannot talk to you in your sleep. Um, the Bible says sometimes he sings over us. Um, you know, so start listening up in, in different ways. So we're going to talk about um, the stages of recovery. The stages of recovery are kind of interesting. And so regardless of what the addiction is, whether it's drugs, alcohol, work, cutting, spending, remember we, we talked about all of that. Some addictions are not chemical addictions. They are um, our behavioral stuff. Religious addiction, all of that kind of stuff, anger, um, insecurity, all that kind of stuff. We can get addicted to our own craziness our own torment and so whatever the addiction is that the way out is about the same because all addictions are caused by um, that mood change that wanting to change so the way um, to your um, recovery is going to be the same so what's really interesting is that and I love this saying um, oh you know what I think that the, it didn't convert well but let me just tell you what it says because that's crazy but it says, like, if we are going to, let's say there's a, there's a tsunami coming, right? And it's huge. We just had an earthquake. This tsunami could take out the entire city. And I decide I'm going to do some work, and I put a sandbag or two in front of my house. Is that going to work? No. So sometimes when we do our recovery on our own and we get our little sandbag out and we put it in front of us, it's not enough. We have to connect and we have to do recovery in a different way. We cannot do it ourselves. We have cultivated and hereded, um, sins that are hereditary that have followed us, addictions that are hereditary, stuff that I have felt and seen since I'm a child. I cannot come against that on my own. It's like putting a sandbag when you're looking at a tsunami coming. So you literally ask God, be my partner in this and, and, and trust the fact that he will. Um, sobriety um, sobriety means that we have a meaningful and comfortable life without the need of our addiction, without drugs, alcohol, or whatever. So it doesn't just mean that I stop. It means I have a good life. So it's different. Some people just white-knuckle it, and they don't have, it's, it, it's, it's not that they got their life back. They just are not with their substance. So we're going to look at sobriety as more than just stopping. Um, sobriety is more than just um, healing the damage. It's a life, living a lifestyle that promotes continued, um, continual uh, physical, psychological, and spiritual health. Um, if I can get to a point where I say I feel good in my own skin, I like my life. When the pastor says, what do you do for play? That I'm, do, I'm taking care of myself in all those ways, that's sobriety. So it's not just, it's just not being clean. Um, abstinence is the beginning of sobriety, right? So when I quit something, that means I'm just starting. It's like half the step. And we talked about this the other day. If you were going to go, to go see a movie, what do you need to go see a movie? A ticket. Can you get in the movie without a ticket if you're not going to just sneak in? <laughs> Can you get in the movie without a ticket? No. You cannot get your life back without abstinence. So I have to stop something. It gives me permission. It gives me the ticket, but it's not my life. It just gives me permission to step in it, into it. So just know that right now with any of our addictions, when we get that and we decide that we're going to quit or stop, even someone says about sexual addictions, you know, uh, man, it's hard because you can go online and do anything. Um, man, be brave enough to get rid of your computer. I know that's like heresy at some level, but it's like you start doing things to step away from your addiction, and that's um, abstinence. But that's the first half a step. Abstinence is necessary for a step, learning what to uh, do to stay healthy in all areas of sobriety. So it's like it, you, we start to look at that and just know that that's, you can't stop there. If you stop there, you're in trouble. Um, how to relapse? Read the next line. Change nothing. How to relapse? Don't do anything. Just stop and sit there. 
you will be in so much pain in a short period of time that it will be, you will feel like it's reasonable to use again. So change nothing and you will relapse. Um, recovery is change. If I'm alone and isolated, jump in the bowl with someone else. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like I have to do something. It's risky to say, you know what? I'm going to grab a partner. I'm going to call someone. I'm going to do something different. But it, it, we have no choice. If we don't do that, I can stay clean for a day, a week, maybe even a year. But I'm white-knuckling it. Has, does anybody know... Um, a sober drunk? <sighs> Did somebody say my husband? <laughs> but, in, you know, some people are, we're, we're sober and we're clean, but all the behaviors are just as hurtful. We're still doing all that kind of crazy stuff. And so it's really about, recovery is about change. It's not about just stopping. It's not about just being clean. It's actually change. Everything in me has to uh, um, um, uh, do this change. Um, there's six uh, passages of recovery. And I'm just going to, we're going to go over them, but I want to read them. Transition, um, stabilization, early recovery, middle recovery, late recovery, and maintenance. Every part of that journey matters. And so we're going to go th um, through some of that. In transition, I'm <laughs> giving up the need to control this addiction like it's really funny to me in my first part of recovery is because like I think you know what how about if I just use on Fridays <laughs> how about if I just drink on holidays how about and so you're at the point where you really don't think the substance or the thing is a problem it's just that you got caught or it's stressing out the people around you or you realize that I'm just doing this too much, so I'm going to try to control that. So the first part of transition is saying it's like when I start to control. Is there any um, um, spendaholics? I'll only buy it if I have cash. <laughs> You know what I mean? I won't take my card or, you know what I mean? It's like, it's for whatever, whether you're, it's food or drugs or whatever, is you start to literally think, and I'm going to control that. If somebody says, are you alcoholic? You'll say, no, no, no. Um, I, I drink a bit, but I'm not alcoholic. So it's that stage where you're really not saying that I am ha having a problem or that this is a problem. It's just saying the way I use it is a problem. But that's an important stage. If you hear someone doing that, that means they're literally walking in the right direction. So don't shame them there. This is an important stage. Where we get out of that stage is when I can finally say, man, I'm an addict. You know, I'm a spendaholic, I'm a drug addict, I'm alcoholic, I need help. When I can finally say that out loud um, without saying the next excuse or the next thing is when I can finally leave that stage and I go to the next one, which is stabilization. <laughs> now I have to recoup from the damage. Remember, I had warrants for my arrest. Um, you know, my body's trashed. I mean, all of that kind of stuff. Any, any food addicts here? Does anybody know a food addict? You know, so you get into even eating is that you have to start looking at the fact that I, the way I've used food and the damage that has caused my body, all that kind of stuff, is during this stage is you start to recoup from that damage. You start looking at what has happened to myself physically, mentally, spiritually. I'm going to kind of um, say that my blood pressure is up or down or got, you know, whatever. So this stage is to go past the point where I'm finally admitting and I start now looking at, um, man, um, um, what are we talking about here? Um, what are we talking about as far as to clean up? For a heroin addict, um, raise your hand if you know withdrawals are tough. Physical withdrawals, tremors, alcoholism, the same thing. Remember when my father um, ended up withdrawing. I mean, he felt like snakes were on him, that he was literally delusional, felt like aliens were going to abduct him and do crazy sexual experimentations on him. His, his ma 
mind and brain literally had that. So you have to go through even sometimes that withdrawal. Even when somebody decides to stop doing their porn addictions or sexual addictions, the withdrawal from that is pretty intense because biochemically what happens in the brain is intense. And when we rewire, we'll feel the physical effects of that. So this stage says, what are you looking at? Um, let me just say to whoever is even considering stuff, we get through this stage. You know, sometimes it doesn't feel like it. You know, prescription drug addicts, it's hard to get through that stage where you give up something and you have to physically feel the withdrawals. But so stabilization is just that at that stage. Early recovery is the internal changes that happen with our thinking and feeling or acting. Um, when we become addicts in whatever level, it takes about a year to become an addict. Yeah, you know that? And what's weird is I start to lie to myself about protecting this object or event to this thing. I start protecting the drug or the sexual stuff. I start getting quiet time. I start disconnecting from people that are going to interfere with my acting out. Um, if I'm a workaholic, I, I actually start to kind of protect whatever it is that I'm doing. If I'm a spendaholic, I actually don't show you the bill for the credit card. I tell my husband, look, and he says, how much did that blouse cost? Oh, I got it on sale. Well, you know, I start doing that kind of stuff. But it takes about a year for you, us to start believing our own lies um, and having this addictive thinking and having this relationship with this thing. And so when I get to this early recovery is I really have to say, what am I thinking? Some recovery groups call it stinking thinking or, or we, start, we, we start to really challenge um, what we're telling ourselves and the lies that we're telling ourselves and the, the way that we excuse our behaviors and all that stuff. You know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been using. The way you look at me makes me want to use. You know, and, and somebody says, well, how about if I look at you this way? No, no, that too. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like we start to challenge that kind of stuff. If it wasn't for the way you treated me, I wouldn't have gone to this other guy or this other girl. If it wasn't for the way um, you don't take care of my needs or you hurt me, I wouldn't eat the way I do. You know, so all of that kind of thinking, we start to challenge that. If I would have been loved, I wouldn't be so angry. You know what I mean? So all of that kind of craziness starts happening. And in this part of recovery, we have the ability to stop and say, what am I thinking? And is that rational? Is it rational? And you know what? Raise your hand if most of the time it's going to be, no, it's not. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not. And so in this place, it's being able to say, do I have enough courage to say I'm going to challenge what I'm saying? Um, you know, um, they've done studies when we walk around angry, and they can test your saliva and the very enzymes in your saliva hurt you on a cellular level. So our thinking hurts us. And if it's irrational, it will keep us in our addictions and it will get us physically ill, sick. And we start hurting other people because we have to act out in some way. And so we become hurtful. And so at this level, I get to challenge all that. Do you think I can do it by myself with my little sandbag? No. Grab hold of a group, a partner, a counselor, somebody that's done recovery before you, but somebody that will honestly say to you, you know, that's not true. Um, it sounds like you're angry about that, but somebody that can literally give you that kind of honest feedback because, you know, um, we believe our lies and we try to prove ourselves right. And at this stage, somebody's going to have to say that's not right. Um, that's going to keep you using. That's going to keep you strung out. That's going to keep you isolated. And so someone will give you permission to say, uh, maybe it isn't true. And if it's not true, what is the truth? And so this stage, you're going to look at that kind of stuff. And it's so incredible because most of us have gotten lost in the lies. Most of us do believe, I think, strategies from the devil himself sometimes that keep us locked up. And this stage says, let's explore that. Uh, middle recovery is we start doing external changes to repair the lifestyle damage caused by the addiction or the use, right? So, you know, just like if you looked at a house and you have to restore a house, man, when you look up long enough to say, if my life was a house, does the roof need to be redone? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If my life was a house, 
Is there any repair work? Is there any, really, the whole structural thing has to be looked at. So this is not just our thinking. This is what we've done in our lifestyles, what we've done to our relationships, even how we set up, um, um, you know, our families and our kids and, and our spouses and our friends and all that kind of stuff. So it's really looking at that kind of stuff. Is there any repair work? And there's tons of it. I used to believe because of the injury with my, with my father is that no man can be trusted. Man, I, I cut down half the population I, I, I cut out. And if somebody walked by me, just walked by me and brushed against me, I would say, you know, you know, what do you want? So I would be on guard. I would literally be on guard with all that kind of stuff. And so at this point, it's looking at that damage. It's looking how it, what I think, and it's looking at what I've done in my relationships because of what I believe and what I've done. It's another place that it's incredible to be. But if you just stop using and you never look at the damage or the crazy thinking, what do you think is going to happen? I will relapse because I will become, I, I will be filled with pain eventually. That stuff will come back. If I start doing the work, and you do the work kind of in groups and with partners with each other, with people that have done recovery, you start doing the work, get a good book. I mean, it, it, there's so much stuff out there. If I do some of this work, um, I won't have to slide back. I mean, I actually get a freedom that's really unbelievable. This part of recovery, middle recovery, it's not something you can do overnight. And these are not like simple fixes. This is where you literally ask God, what's, what's this? Join a group. Watch what somebody else has done. Start being confronted with, um, you know, when somebody says, you know, uh, like I have a guy comes over. He comes over and he says, you know what, Cherie? Um, this guy's a mess. He's a mess. When I first met him, he had 15 facial piercings, eight or nine earrings in each ear, a tattoo of a dragon over his whole body. And I think he was going to beat me up if I talked about any kind of faith at all because he was just not liking that. And um, when he starts doing his recovery, um, he started to look at a number of things. Um, um, in his thinking, when he was, when he was younger... And he'd come home after binging for a, a day or two, three days. He'd come home. His wife would get on his case. So he'd beat her up usually. His baby would start screaming because of all the chaos. And he said, one time I remember picking her up and throwing her across the room to the bed. She was about nine months old and screaming, shut up. He said, I just wanted to sleep. I'm hungover. This kid will not shut up. And finally, he went with a pillow, and he put a pillow over her face until she passed out so he could get some sleep. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? And I'm looking at him like, are you kidding me? So he's stepping into recovery, and those are the, the images that he's seen. And you know what? It was really amazing to listen to the Holy Spirit or listen to God tell him, and I want you to know that you are forgiven. You are forgiven. But man, go tell your daughter, I'm so sorry. So this repair work, this stuff that we get to do in our recovery, it's huge. For him to sit down with his daughter and say, you know what, you have seen me rant and rave and abuse you and your mom your whole life. And I don't know how to make that up to you. I don't know how to change that. But I am so sorry. Would you forgive me? And it's amazing to watch his daughter heal. But he had to do this repair work. It's not enough just to say, you know what, that happened years ago. Um, if you can, um, do the work. Let people know that, you know, I get it. You know, I'm sorry. Um, will you forgive me? Um, and sometimes we will laugh about things and we'll do all that kind of stuff. We'll try to hide it. Um, but it will come back and bite you and you will use again. But if I surrender it, if I say to you um, as my friend, um, will you forgive me? I'm sorry about the money I stole. This guy came over one time. He's in his recovery. And so he's done a lot of work. We've worked with him and his kids and and he came over and he said, Cherie, um, man, they're going to take my driver's license away because I didn't pay my child support. And I said, how much do you owe? And he said, yeah, I think it was about $500. And he, he said, will you give it to me? 
I said, are you kidding me? You know, I don't, and you know, it looks like I have money because I fly all over the place. We are a small organization. Now, you know, most of the time I don't even get a paycheck. So I said, you know, Jim, I'm not giving it to you. For one, it's not good for me to give it to you. And then I, 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 I saw him pull in, and he's got this truck that's to die for with these wheels that are huge, and he likes to mud. He likes to go out um, off trail and, and take his truck. And I said, man, nice tires. Where'd you get those? And he said, I just bought them. Great deal. Really? <laughs> what did they cost you? And he said, hey, I got a steal on about 600 bucks. And I said, how about I find somebody to buy them and you can pay your child support? That you probably won't get 600 because they're used. Maybe three, $400? And he said, no, I just got these. They're going to take your driver's license away. Let's sell them. And he got so mad at me. But even in this stage, it's being able to look at that crazy thinking. You're buying these tires. They're going to take your license away. You're not going to be able to get to work, and you're going to go. You're going to. You, you, you know. You're going to come and ask somebody else for help. And so it's really kind of looking at all that kind of craziness. And if you have somebody, if you are lucky to have somebody as obnoxious as me in your life, I'll tell you straight up. And I hope you tell me straight up. You know what I mean? So you find people like that in your life that will say straight up, you know, you, that's crazy what you're doing right now. You know, you gotta, you got to sell the tires. you got to pay your child support. He walked out storming. He was angry. Came back a little while later and said, you know, I'm sorry. But this is the work you do in middle recovery is you start doing that kind of stuff. You start literally looking at things that you have done um, to hurt people, people that you're resentful of, um, all the, you know, kind of the bitterness that you carry, all that kind of stuff, because all of that is like rotten wood. Does that make sense? All of that will kind of destroy the foundation that you're trying to do. And so it's like being able to look at all that kind of stuff and say, you know what, let's deal with that. And it seems like a lot of work, but it is, it actually is, once you start to do it, it's freeing. It's almost like you get out of, you're, you're, you're kind of in chains, and you literally get to start taking the chains off. It's, a, it's a, an incredible time um, in your life, um, but you've got to intentionally um, choose um, healing. Um, late recovery <laughs> is you grow behind, uh, beyond childhood stuff. My mom tried to self-abort. She never bonded with me. I don't really remember ever um, being loved by her to this day because she just, I found out that she can't do that. She never got it herself. Um, but you go beyond that. I remember in one of my healings, I was at my mom's house and I was on the computer and my, my mom's house is kind of like a druggy house. Everybody stays up till 2.30, 3.30 in the morning. Um, they sleep later. The curtains are kind of drawn most of the time and all that kind of stuff. And so I'm on the computer. It's really late. My sister's dealing pee um, in the garage. So people are coming in and out like at 1.30 in the morning. I even say to my mom, what do you think they're doing in there? Because you get this metal wafting smells through the house. And she says, she just has friends. They like to come over and visit for 10, 15 minutes at a time. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm like, Mom, I know that you're not that stupid. But anyhow, so I'm on the computer. My mom is doing something. My sister's dealing in the garage. And, and at one point, my mom pulls up a chair, and she sits behind me, and she says, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm shocked. She's never said that. And I said, yeah. And I heard God himself, because he's such a reco great recovery partner, is he said, don't turn around. Because if you turn around, she'll stop talking. So just let her talk. Stay with the computer. So I'm staying with the computer, and she said that when she was little, she was given up by her mom, who was alcoholic, and given to an auntie. Um, um, and um, she, in and out, like my grandmother, she fell in love, and she would move her back home, and then she would give her back to the auntie. And so she spent her life kind of in and out of that kind of thing. But this auntie was an amazing woman. Uh, my mom sent me to her when I was 10, 11 years old. So I think that, that she was just, uh, she was just that, that kind of woman that kind of took care of us as kids or took care of my mom when she was a kid for sure. And she said, you know, um, when I was about 10 or 11, she had went through a couple um, grades. They, they put her up grades because she was very bright and, 
and whatever. And so when she was about 10 or 11, um, she was thinking about even high school and about going into an arts program. She applied for this arts academy in Toronto, Canada. And um, um, when she was 12, she got accepted into the ninth grade into an arts academy. And she was a good writer and she was a, a really good artist. And so she said uh, it was so, it was like um, in her mind, it was like her whole life was kind of working out for once. Um, she was so excited. And then she felt like, well, maybe they're just giving me this scholarship because of my age, like I'm a novelty or something. And maybe it's not. It was just kind of like I'm a token um, um, kid that they, they're letting in. And she said the counselor spent time with her. That's not true. You got the scholarship because you're an artist. And, and, and you earned it. This is... We're, we're honored to have you here. And she said it took a while to get that, but she said she got it, and it was the most incredible thing. My grandmother, who's alcoholic, fell in love about that time with another alcoholic. And they decided they were going to come and pick up their daughter and move to another country and start a family. Nobody asked her, what are you doing in high school? What's happening in your life? They just packed her little suitcase and moved her to the U.S., and she said, I never opened up again. If there was a God, how could this happen? She said, I, you know, do you think that this changed my life? Do you think that this hurt me? And I wanted to weep. And, and I really felt like, don't turn around. But I said, I think that changed everything. And I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And what I learned about my mom is she shut off at 12 years old. Never loved anyone, never let anyone love her. Um, her life, she felt, was over. She moved to the U.S., went into high school in the U.S., got pregnant with my dad, who's alcoholic, and you heard the rest of that. Had five kids before she was in her 20s, and her whole life changed. But what I learned about my own recovery is don't think I know what happened to the people ahead of me, even the people that injured me. And I needed to forgive, and I needed to change what I thought about them and about me. And at this point in your recovery, you start to look at that stuff. I, I really believe that there's none of us that are totally innocent and none of us that are totally guilty. You know, there is that kind of what happened in your life that with my dad that caused him to molest his children, what happened to my mom that she couldn't love her kids, what happened to me, you know what? And so this stage, you start to to surrender some of that stuff. And if, if it wasn't true that I am just unlovable or the problem, what is the truth? What is the truth about who I am? What if, what if, and I love this, that I am worth loving? What if I do have gifts? What if what I was told as a kid came through my mother's pain. And what if I could forgive her and ask the people around me that love me, who am I? You know, who am I? And what I found out, and I don't want to sound vain, but I'm an incredible woman of God. I have giftings that I had no idea. And in this part of your recovery, you start to look at some of that kind of stuff. Challenge what you've been told as a kid. Challenge even the, what was screamed at you as a kid. Challenge what happened to other people in their life and the, what you got uh, you know, kind of given. Challenge that. And if it's not yours to carry, surrender it. Don't carry it anymore. And this part of the recovery is really an important part. The next part is my favorite if who I am is okay, if who I am is, what if I am creative? What if I love that kind of stuff? What if, I, I looked at my house and I said, what if I can pick the colors on my wall? And what if I can hang stuff that I like? And what if I can have partnerships and friendships that are um, healthy? And this part you start to actually create. You know what I found out? I hate Christmas. <laughs> Now, you know, I found out in our family, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of alcohol, there's a lot of drugs, and I just, it was stressful. You put up the tree and my palms sweat. You know, I just don't know how to do that, and it doesn't, there's nothing good about it. There's, the way my mind works is that it's stressful. When the holidays start coming, it's stressful. And so Brad and I looked at each other one time, and they said, well, if that's true, what, what, how are we going to do it? And I said, "Han, let's just go skiing. <laughs> 
Let's rent a cabin. We'll take the kids and some friends. We'll ski. We'll have a great time. Um, um, but, you know, so I had to even look. What do the holidays look like um, in your healing? Because it may look different if you have significant family damage. So what do the holidays look like? What is, what is your home going to look like? What are your relationships going to look like? How do you play? How do you laugh? All kinds of stuff. But you start actually um, developing that for yourself. I don't have to make an excuse on why we don't do Christmas. I just have to say, you know what? Brad and I are going to go skiing. Want to join us? Or I'll see you when we get back. My family said, you're not allowed to just ski on Christmas. You have to come home. Well, <laughs> I actually don't, and I love you, but I can't do that anymore. And so that in, in your, when you start to, to literally look at your life and what's that going to look like, um, you start to um, um, kind of create it. I was in my house, and, and, and somebody said, you know, I said, yeah, I don't think I've ever picked the colors for my wall. I don't think I've ever thought about, you know, what I want my even home to look like. And they said, well, think about it now. What color do you like? And I couldn't believe it. I, I, we got paint. And I remember saying to Brad one time, you know what? It's a weird place to have the door there because the door should be right here. And I went to work and I came back and he had sheetrocked that up and put the door over here. It blew my mind. <laughs> I thought, why do we think the door has to be here until the day I die? She rock it, paint it over, put it over here. And I thought, what if we could do that with our lives? What if, what if we're not as stuck as we think we are? And I remember just blowing my mind. Um, a friend came over, and she's a designer. I, I have no gifts at all in that sense. And she said, so you picked your color, and you picked whatever. And she said, anything else? And I said, you know, the fireplace, it's just I wish I could redo that. And she said, let's just put everything aside. What if you could redo it? And what would you do? And I thought, you know, I've seen an Italian tile that I think is just amazing. I think I'd want to do that or stone or something. And, but we have no money, so we just think there's no way. And she said, just put that up in prayer. And there's a guy at our church that does stone work. And he said, can I teach you how to do it? Can I bring the cutters, the, the, what you're going to need. Can I bring all that? Can I show you how to cut stone? Can I show you how to do all of that stuff? And we redid my fireplace, and I cried like a baby the whole time. And it was cheap. The whole painting and everything was done, and it did not cost us much. We did all the work ourselves, and we had friends that actually said, can I teach you how to do this? And I, it was amazing. But in this part of your, in your maintenance, it's being able to say, man, I may have have to go back and do some of that other work once in a while, but I, what does my life look like today? What's, how do I laugh? How do I play? Um, how's mine and Brad's relationship? We're really different, um, but how's that relationship? What do I want it to look like and to be? And you know what? I want to be an incredible wife to him incredible wife to him. Um, um, one time we were in Australia, and I, and I was doing some ministry. It's our anniversary. And so I prayed, God, our anniversary, and we're in Australia. I want to go deep sea diving, hun. And he said, you know, we don't have that kind of money. $300 each to do this dive trip. And I said, I know, I just wanted to think of that. And, and so we, we kind of laughed about it. And, and then I met this girl that had a dive shop. And I said, you know, it's our anniversary, and we were thinking about diving, but we can't afford that. And she said, you know, we both had cancer, and we were talking about, you know, we had, I have leukemia, and she had breast cancer, and we were talking about you know, cancer, because it's really funny um, to do cancer in a, a different way. And so we were joking about stuff. Like, even when I had my first bone marrow biopsy, a friend of mine gave me a bone marrow biopsy punch card. <laughs> And so <laughs> when I went to the oncologist, I said, um, I'm getting my bone marrow biopsy today, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, can you punch my card? <laughs> she, she said, what? And I said, I have a bone marrow biopsy punch card. It says that if I can get six of them, I get the seventh one free. <laughs> <laughs> and oncologists are very serious. She's like, <laughs> and I thought, I, I finally had to say it's a joke. She said, oh. Gave me the card back. She did, you know, but you know, even, even. <laughs> so even with her, we laughed. Um, I, you, I have a, a cancer card, and the cancer card says three times a year I can use this card. So if you call me and say, you know what, we just uh, voted and we want you on the nominating committee, 
I can say, I'm sorry, I have cancer. <laughs> But I can only use it two more times if I use it for that. So I mean, so her and I were laughing about. Um, there's a website called MyCrazySexyCancer.com, and so it's just a funny way to, that people um, uh, do the cancer with laughter. So we were talking about that, and she said, "You know what? Let me see if I can get you a discount on this dive trip. I think I can get you like 10% off." Raise your hand if you know that's still not enough. <laughs> I mean, like 10% enough when you don't have money. That's just ridiculous. So I, I said, you know, um, probably that um, won't help us, but thank you for that. And she called a little while later to the pastor I was staying with, and she started laughing. And she, I said, what? And she said, I got you the trip on the best ship, four dives for $25. <laughs> and I thought, oh, stop. How ridiculous is that? $25. We get there, and the owner of the ship meets us because I think he's like, who is this that they got this trip for $25? So he meets us, and he introduces us to the crew. And the crew says, who is it that the owner is introducing that? And so we were treated like royalty the entire time. The underwater videographer filmed us on every dive, every dive, and gave us a disc that said happy anniversary and the disc of our dives. But we were on the ship. Brad and I, we were laughing. It was in the Fort Douglas um, um, by Cairns in Australia. We just did this dive. And I remember laughing with him, and I looked around, and I said, you know, we're the couple that I always dreamt about, <laughs> you know? And how cool is that? You know, so I think that on this stage, what do you want in your life? And whatever it is that you want, make it happen with your choices. You know, I want to be a good wife. And Brad's obnoxious sometimes, you know, so it was tough to deal with that. I am hard to live with at times. It, he had to make a conscious decision to deal with that. But we have decided that we want to be that couple. So we intentionally work on our stuff. And so on this stage of your life, you literally, it doesn't just, life doesn't just happen to you. It's what you want, what you choose on a daily basis. And so this maintenance is such a cool uh, time is that you start to actually choose um, what does it look like. And so for me, the, the whole transition, there's a whole transition in recovery is not what you don't do, it's what you do, Right? If that was just what you don't do, that's just getting the ticket. I don't use anymore, right? But everything else is intentional. Every other step from challenging when the Bible says, take every thought captive. Man, if I could say, let me give everybody a cell phone, and every time you thought a twisted thought or a negative thought, your cell phone lit up. <laughs> what would it look like in this room? What it, would it look like walking around town? Man, we really trash ourselves in our heads. So when we step into recovery, it's every thought captive. What are you thinking? What do you tell yourself? What do you say or think about your spouse or about your kids, about what's happening in the church or the community? Stop that. In recovery, you literally have to say, I'm not willing to go there anymore. I'm not willing to, uh, to think that anymore, to go there anymore. I'm not willing to let myself just ramble in my head or be tormented in my head. I'm not willing to have my house feel like this anymore, my relationships feel like this. And so the only one that can choose is you, the only one. You know, when the pastor says, can I, you force someone into recovery? No. But man, can you force somebody out of recovery? No, no, you know, can you force me to give up my life and go back to the way I was? No, because I cannot. Um, I actually feel what it feels like to be in my own skin, and I like it. I still have tons of work to do, tons of work. You know, ask my husband. <laughs> you could just text him and say, you know, is Cherie done with all that stuff? No, but every day my choice is to do the work. My choice is to make sure that I play and get enough sleep. And, you know, that the only time that I really push myself hard is on these bigger trips. But I only do a couple of these three-week trips a year now because um, I, I, it's just, um, I really take care of myself in a different way. But it's intentional. So it's not what you don't do. Recovery is what you choose to do. And it's an incredible gift 
Um, but you have to make the choice. I think, um, I think that's it. Any questions? Comments? Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, yes. Oh, you know what? Um, I think I put everything, all the pictures, on my external hard drive. Let me think where I could find. Um, maybe I can do. He just sent me an email today. Can you still see that up there? Do you want to see my horses working with each other? Yeah. So can we do this real quick? So this is Pegasus and Riley. Pegasus is making Riley do his round pen work. <laughs> and I've never seen them do that, but see how he turns around? And watch what happens next. Brad just sent me this today. I thought it was so funny. So there he goes. <laughs> so so um, I will, I'll bring a picture of Brad tomorrow because I have an external hard drive that I download all my pictures to, and he's on there and my daughter and everything. But he's an incredible guy. Um, different than me in every way. Um, um, his, he was a Boy Scout till he was 18. Um, um, he's not a druggie, um, arrogant as anything. Um, had to deal with that kind of stuff. But um, we are different in every way, but I am really lucky to have him. Um, and for women, I just want to say, um, the reason I feel lucky is I intentionally decided to love him. Do you hear what I'm saying? So somebody says, well, I don't have a husband like yours. Man, I didn't until I decided to love him. It's a huge thing when you decide to intentionally love the people around you, and they change right in front of you. It's, a, it's amazing to me when you talk to Brad about me now. He will say, I have the most beautiful wife. Not beautiful physically, but I have the most beautiful wife. So he, I intentionally decided to love him. Um, he intentionally decided to love me. And so it's, it's really amazing in our recovery to in, the, in our faults, in our junk, in the stuff that we have to heal from. Um, um, Brad, he drives me crazy. I'll go to the store and I'll think, wow, look at those grapes. How, how, how cool is that? And I'll grab some and I'll bring them home. Brad will say, how much did they cost? Like, who checks that? <laughs> I don't know how much they cost. And, but Brad will go to three different stores to get the best deal for grapes. You know, and I think you went to three different stores. <laughs> it took you like an hour and a half of driving to get that grape. Do you realize for gas and time, and, and so we're different. And he used to say, you know what, if you loved me, you would check the price of those grapes. <laughs> and I said, if you loved me, you would get off my case. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had to intentionally decide, because we're not anything like each other. You know, he just says, like, he dropped me off at the airport one time, and I'm going on a trip, and he said, what airlines? And I thought, oh, I forgot to check. And he's like, what? <laughs> you forgot to check? And I said, we live in a small town. The airport is tiny. I'll just go to the counters and find out where I fit. And he's like, don't do that. I hate when you do that. And I said, you know, hon, I'm fine. So I get out, and I find where I'm at, and I fly away. But for him, he would never walk out the door without knowing. Um, I have a bad hip, a disease since I was a little girl, Perthes disease. I wore braces and crutches as a kid. Um, it, it was in pain one day. I called the doctor from the magazine that I look at about hip replacements. I love his work. I've been following him since I was 19, and I called his office to see if he could schedule me and do my hip because, I mean, I want him to do it. He's, just a, he's almost the best in the U.S., and he says, he answers the phone, which I thought was funny. And he said, you know what? We're doing a study with the FDA. If you can get here in a week, I'll, I'll do your hip. So I called Brad at work. I'm going to Philadelphia to get a new hip. He's like, you can't just go to Philadelphia to get a new hip. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can't go with you. It's Christmas, and I'm, I'm, I've got the Nutcracker. I've got Messiah. You know, we're working. You know, that's the busiest season for him. And I said, I'm a big girl. I'm just getting a hip, which was a stupid thing to say because it felt like I got hit by a Mack truck trying to fly home with this new hip. Um, but um, we are really different, really different. But the only reason it works is we decided 
to love each other. I decided to forgive him for being different. He decided to forgive and love me. So it wasn't that all of a sudden God just gave me the perfect guy. Um, if you met him, you would l learn quick enough that he is not the perfect guy. If you saw me when I'm PMSing, you would learn quick enough <laughs> that, it, you know, it's a decision. So th in this last stage, it's an intentional decision. If you love um, art, start doing it. Don't wait. If you love whatever, start to literally figure out stuff that you maybe didn't do. Um, I took writing course. I've written five books. I mean, I like to write, which is crazy. You know, I, 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 you know, so it's like whatever intentionally you have to do in your life, you start to choose that. And somebody says, I can't do that because I have kids. Not true. I can't do that because of this. All of those lies you have to confront because they are lies. Um, you will do it differently now than you do it five years from now or when your kids grow up, all that kind of stuff. You will go through those changes. Um, when you literally look at your life and you say, I can't do that because my life's over. No. If I can put a mirror under your nose and it steams up, your life is not over. <laughs> you know? And so it's like being able to say recovery is intentional, literally intentional, and you are the only one that can choose life or death. And we choose that every day, every hour sometimes, sometimes every minute. Um, but man, you got to start choosing. Any other comments, questions? You sure? All right. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to, the, yes. Right. So everybody's an individual, so we don't have the same. Like somebody may stay in that first part of transition for two years. Somebody may stay for two weeks. It really is that we individually, but we don't leave one stage without doing the work. Like I can't leave that transitional stage and still use or still have those excuses or still do whatever. So I'm really not going to go into the next stage until I finally can say, man, it's, it's, it's this addiction that has kept me um, in bondage. It's the way I, you know, it's, it's my anger or religious addiction or drug addiction or whatever. So I, so I don't literally go to the next stage without doing that. If I stay in that stage and I change nothing, what happens? You relapse. You change nothing, nothing changes. And so it's like, but, it, but the time for each of us in each of those stages. You know, where I spend most of my time at is in maintenance. Um, but man, every once in a while, I have to go all the way back to the beginning. What am I um, twisted up about right now? So I'll jump back, do the work, come back to maintenance. Because where I want to live is I want to live in my own skin. Um, when someone says, you know what, Shree, you look so confident in who you are, um, that's intentional. Um, it's intentional. Um, you have to decide to do your life. Thank you for asking that. Yes. Yeah. It's huge. What's your name? Uh, ben. Ben. And so you know what? Right now, I'm doing my recovery. Exactly right. Sometimes it, we can be in the midst of our craziness, but if you reach out and do anything for anyone else, you'll get a little bit of sanity back. Anything. Um, whether it's another addict, whether it's somebody that is just dealing, you know, stressing out. Sometimes you'll, you'll see, for me, I'll see um, a parent just sitting there with a kid that is screaming their head off. And what if I could just say a joke for a minute and distract that kid and they stop screaming? They, you know, I'm outside of myself and I'm reaching out. So it's helping 
anybody at any point is going to help in your recovery. That's why, you know, we talked about doing groups that you guys are going to follow up with a group. Is sometimes in group work, you, you, you are saying your own stuff, but most of the time you're listening to someone else and giving them the ability and the privilege of working through their own stuff. And so you're, you're helping someone. And Nigel, when you talked earlier today and you said one time you just, it was killing you. You didn't want to go to group. You didn't want to interact with anybody, but you went and someone said, something that gave you a break and so it's like even doing that kind of stuff it's it's a, it's huge we cannot put our little sandbag out <laughs> and do it on our own but we start connecting with each other and it's huge so thank you ben for that um thank you see you tomorrow so on that note if you want to connect with wendy just put your hand up again wendy um, she will. Uh, she, if you if you're interested in that uh, 14 week, uh, once a week evening meeting, that group uh, recovery life group thing, then uh, please have a chat with Wendy, and she will take your name down. Also, being the second last night tonight, you will have noticed by now that there are three cameras in the church, and we have been recording these meetings. So if you've got someone, no way. You didn't know you were being recorded. <laughs> Some things you would have said differently, Sheree. <laughs> So, uh, so if there's somebody that hasn't been here and you would really like them to have a look at this, you think they might be open to it, uh, there's, a, there's a, a blue pen at the back on that sound desk there. There's a white piece of paper. And if you just want to put your name and a contact number or an email address down, and as soon as those DVDs are ready, we'll be able to get hold of you and uh, you'll be able to get a copy of those. So two things. Uh, speak to Wendy if you want to put your name down for the group and um, make a note of your contact details if you want us to uh, get those DVDs to you. Tell and then, me group. which group? Yeah, group? Wednesday they, evening? Yeah, they said that they didn't know there was a group running. So I thought you had said it over and over. But yes. Maybe. So Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, 22nd of July, we begin our journey. 14 weeks, once a week, uh, doing this recovery thing together so that we're not alone in it. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, again, refreshments down the hall, prayer ministries in here immediately after this. And I invite you just to bow your heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for, um, for just putting a bit of a road map in front of us tonight. Just helping us maybe to see where we are in that journey. Some of us, well, we're all probably in different places. Some thinking about getting on the journey, some just starting the journey, some in middle recovery, some in late recovery. And we just pray, Lord, that you will continue wherever we are to take us by the hand and to lead us from one step to the next. And every time that next step just seems insurmountable, it just seems scary, it seems like we don't know what's on the other side. Lord, we just pray that again, you would give us the confidence to look upward and that you'd surround us with your presence and let us know that we are not alone. And I pray, Lord, that you will uh, just guide and direct, uh, that we will know the joy of freedom and recovery. So bless us tonight and uh, those that are, that are just in need of, of prayer and connection. And uh, we, we just ask, Lord, that you will bring us all together in these next few minutes as we pray with one another. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.